For many years, the Bible captivated the interest of Ron Wyatt, and he had it in his heart to show people that the Bible is true, that the miracles really happened, and that there is a God who we have to have a relationship with. But his work was to meet great resistance from both fellow Christians as well as scientists who don't want to believe or relate to the living God. Among the many discoveries he made was Noah's Ark, where he was held captive by PKK terrorists in eastern Turkey. And the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that God destroyed with fire and brimstone. He risked his own life and was imprisoned for one month in Saudi Arabia because he wanted to reveal to the world that at the real Mount Sinai there was archaeological evidence of the Israelites. He also showed where the Red Sea crossing took place and Pharaoh's army drowned and the several evidences under the sea that proved the story was true. He showed the possible place for the Israelite camp in Kadesh Barnea where Moses struck the rock and the water gushed out. Here, it was obvious that water had once come pouring out of the stone foundation and drained down into the valley, yet nowhere in this vicinity is there any water supply. Most of those who knew Ron thought that what made the biggest impression on people was his genuine care for others and his humility. Almost 30 years ago, Ron Wyatt was walking over there between this wall and the Golgotha Escarpment with an employee from the Israeli Antiquities Authority. Suddenly, he raised his hand near to Golgotha Escarpment and he said, that's Jeremiah's Grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. Both of them were very surprised by this statement, and Ron received verbal permission to dig there. Ron, who had his regular work beside his archaeological research, travelled home to decide as to whether or not to accept this task. Was the Ark of the Covenant really hidden there? And why, after so many years, did God want to unearth it again? Several thousands of years ago, Abraham came to this country. He was promised by the God of heaven that his descendants would have permission to live here. Abraham was chosen to keep the truth pure at a time when myths about God were deeply embedded in Mesopotamia. Several hundred years had passed since the flood, an event that was well known by the kings in Mesopotamia. Cuneiform tablets like this from the British Museum tell of the great flood. The Mesopotamian kings claimed they were chosen and inaugurated by the highest god, and their kingship could be traced way back to before the flood. It is found in the Sumerian list of kings. Few would challenge the king's claims. Their presentation of religion was seen as common knowledge. History tells us 
that Mesopotamia spread their teaching about God to the entire Middle East, Asia and Europe through their trade. But what they claimed was a lie. God had not chosen them, but had chosen a man who lived in their midst. His name was Abraham. On God's command, Abraham travelled from Mesopotamia to Canaan, which today is Israel. God promised him that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars, and in his seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The Saviour that God had promised through Adam and Eve, Messiah, will be born from Abraham's seed. Abraham was given the task of guarding the truth. His descendants were to protect the truth right up to the coming of the Messiah and confirm the truth to the whole world. God honoured Abraham because Abraham honoured God first. God himself said, Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my commandments, statutes and judgments. Many of the commandments of God had also been kept in Mesopotamia, but they were selective of which laws they kept. That can be seen on the law of Hammurabi and the Shayan collections. Abraham kept all of God's commandments. The commandments that the others around him disregarded were those commandments that specified the true worship of God, the first four commandments in the Ten Commandment law. These commandments the king of Babylon threw out. I'm sure you know the history. The descendants of Abraham ended up in Egypt where they were suppressed by Pharaoh after they grew in number. There they were forced to break the Sabbath commandment that was given at creation and that Abraham kept. What Abraham taught them was now mixed with Egyptian teachings and the truth that they were chosen to protect was now darkened. With a mighty hand God delivered them out of Egypt by his servant Moses to save the very people who would prepare the way for Messiah through their lives and teachings. God even parted the Red Sea for them so they could safely pass through, and safely on the other side they were led to Mount Sinai. During the Israelites' captivity in Egypt, they mixed a great deal of paganism with the truth of God. It was therefore necessary and important for God to teach them His truth and His commandments all over again. So Moses climbed the mountain and received two tables of stone, upon which God had written His Ten Commandments with His own finger. This is the only thing we have on earth that God has written with His own finger. The only document from the Creator Himself. These ten words were called the Testimony as it was God's testimony to the world. Beside the Ten Commandments, there was another covenant they entered into. And this covenant says if they were loyal to God, then He will choose them over the other nations. They also received civil laws to maintain law and order. And it's important to separate the commandments from the civil laws. The Ten Commandments is a universal law. Moses was directed to build a sanctuary. Everything that he was to build, he would build according to the design of the temple he was shown in heaven. The Ten Commandments, or the Testimony of God as it was called, was put into the ark. And on this ark there was a covering that was called the Mercy Seat. It was a place of atonement.
After they built it, they placed the furniture in the positions God showed them. The altar of burnt offering symbolized the sacrifice of the coming Saviour. And the bronze laver that symbolized cleansing, or cleansing of baptism. And further on into the holy place, we have the table of showbread. With the bread that symbolized God's word, which we should eat. Here, on the other side, we have the seven-branched candlestick that was a symbol of God's congregation, and the oil that symbolized the spirit that God would send to his people. And further on, we have the altar of incense, which symbolized the prayers of the faithful ascending up to heaven. And then, in the most holy place, is the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony that Moses was asked to make with the Ten Commandments inside. This symbolized that it was God's Ten Commandments that had been broken and demanded a blood sacrifice. The blood symbolized the Savior that would come and take the penalty for the people who had sinned against their Creator, breaking His commandments. Through the sanctuary, the Israelites were to preserve the meaning behind Jesus' mission to come and die for the world and preserve God's true commandments, the law that had been broken. The sanctuary also showed how mankind could again be reconciled to God but the children of Israel were somewhat reluctant to carry this responsibility, as the commandments would separate them from the rest of the world. They were not allowed to have statues of God, or pray before pictures or idols, nor were they allowed to worship any other God, and they had to refrain from work on the Sabbath. But the Israelites preferred to be like the nations around them, and do what they did. After a while, they broke all of the first four commandments, which described how to be loyal to the only true God. They placed idols all over Jerusalem and on the high places, and prayed to other gods, to the Queen of Heaven and other lesser gods. And they placed symbols of pagan gods, like the sun, in God's temple. After the Israelites had deceived God and failed their task given them, God allowed Babylon to conquer Israel and capture the temple, allowing it to be destroyed. But before the destruction of Jerusalem, God saw to it that the Ark of the Covenant and the other furniture from the temple were hidden. There have been several theories as to where the Ark was hidden, everything from pagan temples in Ethiopia to caves in the desert. But throughout all history, God has never allowed the Ark to successfully stand among pagan idols. God's struggle to mould the descendants of Abraham into the people who were to prepare the way for the Saviour was not over yet. After their dispersion into other countries, the children of Israel converted. Thus, God returned them to their land and its capital, Jerusalem. Many times, when they were dispersed, just as God foretold, he gathered them back again to their land. They rebuilt the wall and the temple, but were never given back the Ark of the Covenant. So what was God's plan for the Ark of the Covenant and his testimony? Did he have another testimony that he wanted to add to the Ark before the world would see it once again?
When Ron Wyatt decided to begin excavation, it wasn't as easy as he first thought, but he invested any money he had to finance it. Here, we will let him tell the story in his own words. This was recorded in Zedekiah's Caves in 1997. So anyway, I was walking along the cliff face behind this bus station back in this area. Well, since you saw the cutouts, okay, I was walking through there. My left hand went out without my brain doing it, and my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's Grotto in the Ark of the Covenants in there. Well, I was dumbfounded. This sort of thing doesn't happen to me. In fact, you know, I resist that sort of thing because people that I consider wackos say they have those kinds of experiences. And I still think that most of them that say they have these experiences are wackos. But sometimes, in other words, I don't feel comfortable with that kind of experience. But our tickets were due the next morning, so we flew home. I told the man, he said, that's wonderful. He says, we'll let you dig there. We'll give you all the help you need, a place to stay, provide you food, do your laundry. And this is a uh, Israeli. They don't do that. Period. Is that Colonel Baha'i? I won't name names at this point in time. So anyway, <coughs> We went home, and I had no idea why the Ark of the Covenant had been there. I never even thought about it. You know, my cup was running over already with things that God had shown me. And so, you know, I was not looking for anything else. So I went home, prayed, and asked the Lord to help me understand why the Ark of the Covenant might possibly be in that place. I was impressed to read the history of the conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king at that time. And in this uh, Second Kings chapter 25, and the last part of that chapter, it says that Nebuchadnezzar built forts against the city round about. That in modern uh, language is a siege wall. Now this meant that nobody could take anything out of the city or bring anything in the city. So the Ark of the Covenant had to be hidden in the city, under the city, or inside the siege wall. All right? Well, <clears throat> we don't know for sure where the Babylonian siege wall was located, but we know where Titus's siege wall was located. All right? Catapults had the same range back in Nebuchadnezzar's time as they did in Titus's time. And they always built these siege walls out of range of the catapults that were defending the city. So we know where it had to have been. And from that siege wall, people could not observe, you know, watchmen walking the wall, the siege wall, couldn't observe somebody bringing something out into that cliff over there. So I thought, okay, that makes it reasonable. We got ready came back and started digging January 1979. It had come a real wet, sloppy snow that year. I mean, it was horrible. This thing had been filled with garbage. We found two dead cats in there. I've got a picture, of a moving picture, of a cat that came up to where we were working and it stood there and looked at us for a bit and then it just turned and walked off like, you know, what are you idiots doing there? But uh, anyway, in January 6, 1982, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I found the Ark of the Covenant. Right? You would not believe the amount of stone and dirt and everything we had made. God kept our interest up by thinking that just any minute we'd find it. You know, for all of that time. Usually the carrot doesn't work for that long a period of time. 
I think you know about holding a carrot in front of something so, to get it to move. So anyway, we found it. Now, I hadn't thought anything about the crucifixion site. Like everyone else, I thought it was up by that Muslim graveyard on top of that cliff. And in fact, I went up there looking one day for it, and a couple of Muslims kind of helped me off of the <laughs> out of the place. My feet touched the ground about every ten feet. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't see any evidence up there. But as we dug down the face of that cliff, we found those three cutouts. Now, folks, there was only one crucifixion site in Jerusalem, and that is it. Not only that, the place where they crucified people was the same place where they stoned the people, right? There's a very strong tradition, in fact, there's a big church built up there, where they supposedly stoned Stephen. Remember the story in the Bible? And he said, I beheld heaven. He says, uh, I beheld heaven open and I saw the Son of Man, or Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God. And there's a special, this is a special place up there. There's a book by that title for sale in there. And I suggest you get it. It's a very good book. So anyway, when I found the cutouts, we were digging along the cliff face, but the dirt out here was beginning to threaten to fall in on us and bury us. So I went to the left, dug a shaft straight down, and you know where that little bench, that curved bench is sitting out there, and that uh, pillar? By the way, those are pagan symbols. What they're doing in there, in a Christian place, is amazing. But it's a symbol of sun, sun worship, and the pillar is a phallic symbol fertility symbol. They're not right over the Ark of the Covenant, but they're, I'm surprised they are even that close. So as we tunneled along at the quarry floor, at the base of the wall, I found the cross hole. And I worked around and found some more cross holes four feet lower on the real quarry floor. I thought this was the quarry floor, but actually it was a, a kind of a bench-like thing uh, where they hadn't taken the last set of blocks out as they quarried their way down. And so anyway, I prayed, Lord, where shall I go now? Now, we had found the crucifixion place and I was quite excited about that. But we were looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And if I had had my way, I would have found the Ark of the Covenant and I would not have found the crucifixion site because I wasn't looking for it. As always, God had more in mind than I had in mind. As a, uh, more than any of us humans, he says, that he will give us more than we can ask or think. And I found that to be very true, and of course you will find that to be very true too, and some of you already have, those that are sharing things with other people. Because today God is taking a strong hand in finishing his work. Anyway, I was impressed to break right through the cliff. Not this cliff, but one that looked every bit as solid. Right? Well, <clears throat> I'm dumb, but I didn't think I was that dumb. <laughs> so anyway, I kept looking around for a place to get in that cliff, I knew there were caves in there because honeybees were coming out of cracks and flying in. So they had their nests in there. So anyway, my youngest son, he says, Dad, have you prayed about this? And I said, yes, you know, I should have prayed with my sons. We look back and we see mistakes we've made. But he asked, and we did pray together at night and morning, but I should have prayed right there. 
anyway, <clears throat> he said, did you pray about this? I said, yes. He said, well, did you get any indication of what to do? I said, yes. I'm supposed to break right through that cliff. And he says, well, let's do it. And I said, no way. That's stupid. I'm not doing it. So we worked for three or four more days, and it was time to leave the next day. And my older son was down, my oldest son was down with me, and we were handing the tools out to my youngest son to store them. And my older son is rather a quiet person. He said, Dad, did you pray about this? I said, sure, yes, I did. He said, well, I said, I was impressed to break through that cliff right there. Yes, yes. And he said, well, let's do it. And I said, no, that's stupid. I am not beating my brains out against a cliff. He says, well, Dad, pardon my saying so, but I've seen you do stupider things than that. I said, okay, tell Ronnie to pass the tools back now. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see a crack right here. Right? It's not much of one, but it is a fault line through that stone. So we went 18 inches over to this side, took our hammers and chisels and started marking the stone up and down and up and down. Finally, a big chunk popped out of there. Pushed it off to the side, looked back in the bottom. There was a small dark hole about that big. It didn't look very promising at all. I had my son hand me the flashlight. We had had him sitting where we could see. This was all down in a tunnel. And so I put it up to that hole and there was a big cave chamber back behind that. Have you ever had goosebumps and all of that sort of thing just overwhelm you? Well, that's what happened to me. It didn't take us very long to make the hole big enough to get in. I thought the Ark of the Covenant would be sitting right there. So since we had to leave the next morning, we plugged that hole, we came back to the surface, plugged the hole, fixed everything up so nobody could tell where we had been and left. I had to go home, work, save up some more money, come back. But eventually, I found the Ark of the Covenant, and it was in a chamber that I would not have bothered going in, just like I wouldn't have bothered breaking through the wall. My two sons had gotten very ill in 1982. Uh, uh, I sent one of them home Christmas Eve, the other one home New Year's Eve. I owed the hotel $300. I had no money at all. As a friendly Arab let me seat at his restaurant. And that, folks, to me is humiliating. Now, there are some things that I'm not comfortable with, and I was experiencing several of them that trip. I decided that I was going to find the Ark of the Covenant or die in the hole. This uh, may sound a little melodramatic, but I was humiliated. I couldn't pay my bill at the hotel. I'd rather be dead than in a situation like that. And that's not good logic. So don't go down and do likewise on that one. So anyway, the, the little Arab guy that was letting us eat at his restaurant, he was a full grown man, but he's about that tall and small the teeth. So as we went through this cave system, he would crawl into the chambers and I'd give him a light and he'd shine it around and I'd peek through to see if it looked like anything in there. So we did this over and over and uh, we came to this one hole that we had, I mean you wouldn't believe where all we had gone in that cave. However, how many of you have ever been inside a big cave? The tunnels and chambers and all. Hey, you know what I'm saying? We had just been all over the place, up and down, different levels. And at this point in time, we had gone about 45 feet down and then back up. And here this hole was in the wall, about that big around. And it, there was a stalactite hanging right down the middle of it. It's the only stalactite I had seen in the cave 
that wasn't just little ones. This was a big one, and I have it in my collection of things. So I broke it off, made the hole big enough for him to get in, and he was crawling in there, and I started to hand him the light so he could do what we had been doing, you know, several days. He came tearing out of there, his mind, uh, eyes were big as human eyes can get, and he said, what's in there, what's in there, I'm not going back in there. And I said, well, what did you see? He said, I didn't see anything. And I thought, well, okay. Now he had been in tighter places than that and had not responded that way. So I got this little beam of light, you know, in a very dark place here. And I thought, that is divine terror. You know, that's supernatural terror. So I figured there's got to, that is either where the Ark of the Covenant is or it's the way to get to it, one or the other. And God doesn't want this fella to know where it is. So anyway, he said, he, he just said, I, I, I must get out of here. So off he went. So I made the hole big enough for me to get in. I got in there and folks, it was full of rocks, bigger than these here up to within 18 inches or so of the ceiling. If this young man hadn't been terrorized and come scooting out of there like he did, I would not have gone in that place. Who needs rocks? We've been moving thousands of them for three years. So anyway, I crawled in there with the flashlight and I crawled around on top of the rocks and I shined the light down between the cracks in the rock and there a gold, flat gold thing uh, reflected back at me. So I moved over and shined down to another. There was two reflections, one here, one there, and one over here. So I knew it was a flat gold top and I thought the Ark of the Covenant I forgot about the cherubims, you know, sitting on top. They'd have been poking up through if that was the top of the mercy seat. But anyway, I started moving these rocks, and I stuck them everywhere I could. By the time I got down to that gold surface, I had them behind my shoulders, leaning back against them, and uh, it, turned, it was the table of showbread. Well, hey, that's not a bad thing, huh? <laughs> But anyway, I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And it was only then that I took time to carefully examine the rest of the chamber. See, I had just crawled in, took a quick look, and started checking down under the rocks. So as I moved the flashlight along the wall, I saw a stone box sitting against the wall about this low, this much space between it and the ceiling. The lid was broke, slid around, and right above it was a crack with dark brown looking material at the bottom of, on the bottom of this crack. And I was able to see the top of the lid of the box. On both sides of the broken pieces was more of this brown stuff. All of a sudden I realized I was sitting in front of the Ark of the Covenant and that Christ's blood had come down. I had never heard anybody preach anything about that sort of possibility. And it was too much for me. I, when I regained consciousness and looked at my watch again, 45 minutes had passed from the time I crawled in the chamber because I figured I'd find the Ark of the Covenant in there. I wanted to know what time it was. So anyway, it was 2 o'clock when I entered the chamber. And after I regained consciousness, it was 245. I couldn't see down in there, but I knew what it was.
Later, Ron Wyatt would confirm that this was the Ark of the Covenant, and that the blood on the mercy seat was from someone who had only one human parent. There were no paternal chromosomes except for one Y chromosome. Jesus was God's only begotten son, just as he said he was. The Bible prophesied that Christ's blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, but as it was to be kept secret until our time, it was partially, but not totally, hidden in symbols. Matthew recorded an earthquake at the cross, which formed a crack in the ground below it. John tells us that when the Roman soldier pierced the side of Christ, blood and water ran out. The blood and water apparently ran down the earthquake crack. The prophet Isaiah wrote that Jesus, when he was bruised and broken, would sprinkle many nations. Jesus himself said, when he initiated the communion service, that he would enter into a covenant with all people through his blood, the blood of the covenant. The blood would confirm this covenant. When Jesus became the sacrifice, he sprinkled his blood himself, and thus fulfilled the role of the high priest. He then became both high priest and victim. Paul told us that Jesus confirmed the covenant in the same way as Moses confirmed the Old Covenant with the Israelites. In Exodus, we can read how the First Covenant was confirmed. In his letter to the Hebrews, Paul writes how Jesus confirmed the Everlasting Covenant in the same way that Moses confirmed the covenant between the people and God. Whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, which God hath enjoined unto you. He took blood and water, and sprinkled it upon the words of the covenant. This symbolized two things, that these very words, written in the book, are the covenant and the blood symbolized forgiveness for breaking that covenant, as the blood from the sacrificed animal was always a symbol of Christ. Scarlet wool and hyssop represented the true mission of the sacrificial lamb. In the Bible, we're told that wool symbolizes purity and scarlet symbolizes sin. So just as the wool became scarlet, thus Christ, the innocent lamb of God, took upon himself our sin. In the scripture, hyssop is a symbol of cleansing. Jesus took our sins to cleanse us. From this ceremony, we know exactly what to expect in the anti-type. According to the type, we can expect Jesus to confirm the true covenant by sprinkling his blood and water over what now makes up the covenant, while simultaneously offering himself to cleanse people from their sins. These people he confirmed the covenant with were therefore asked by Christ to keep the very words of that covenant. John reveals to us a secret. He tells us that the blood and water is here on earth as a testimony. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son. The prophet Isaiah is connecting Jesus' death on the cross to a time where he will sprinkle many nations. Isaiah continues on to say that this will one day be revealed and will leave even the world's rulers utterly speechless. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him for what had not been told them they will see and what they had not heard they will understand. When the prophet Daniel was given the task of prophesying of the coming Messiah he made a clear reference to the mission of Jesus to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. It's also written that when Jesus died, the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place was ripped in two, but the Ark of the Covenant was not there. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Right before the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, the ark was hidden. The very ark of the covenant 
with the testimony of God or the law that the people had broken and that we need atoning for. God knew where Jesus was to suffer and die for humanity and 600 years before the crucifixion he hid the ark right under the Golgotha escarpment. So what does this discovery tell us? Well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God really did give his Son to take upon himself the punishment for our sins. But this discovery tells us much more. It tells us what God's covenant with us is, and what law we have broken and need forgiveness for. But it also tells us what the covenant with us is not. And now the excitement begins, so watch. God wants to reach everyone, and in the past he has used object lessons to teach the truth. When Ron Wyatt asked when this discovery was going to be shown to the world, he was told something very special, that it would not be shown until the Mark of the Beast law was passed. The Bible tells us of a deception that will come upon the world. The Antichrist will place himself in God's temple, claiming to be God himself. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Ron was told that the law of God will be shown to expose the Antichrist, and to save the world from this deception. How will this expose the man of sin? I'll show you now. 
The Ark of the Covenant is made up of two parts. The bottom part is called the Ark of the Testimony, because it contained the testimony of God, the Ten Commandments. The top part was called the Mercy Seat, and in Hebrew it is Kaporet, which means a place for atonement. The law and atonement or mercy are the two main parts of God's covenant with mankind. That's where we get the name, the Ark of the Covenant. In the Bible, we're told that the sanctuary was made according to a design in heaven. The one built on earth was a symbol of God's plan of salvation and Jesus' priestly ministry. Paul describes in his letter to the Jews that Jesus is our high priest in heaven, and the earthly priesthood has ended, but a more excellent priesthood and a greater and more perfect tabernacle began when the earthly services ended. That's where Jesus goes with his own blood when he intercedes to God for people, just like the high priest did with the blood of the sacrificial lamb on behalf of the Israelites. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our high priest, our only mediator, and our only way to salvation, and that he is the head of the church on earth, and he is our king. It also says that he has the keys of death and of hell. After Jesus went into the heavenly sanctuary, God would not allow the earthly one to be rebuilt. It has been almost 2,000 years since it was destroyed, and the Jews, still to this day, have never been able to rebuild it. It is not the Jewish temple that the Antichrist will place himself in. When Christ went into the true sanctuary, God's earthly sanctuary was to change from being physical to spiritual. Paul said that now, the congregation, every believer, is now God's temple on earth. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. It is exactly this temple that Antichrist wants to place himself in and seek to destroy. We are the temple in which the Antichrist wants to show that he is God. That means the Antichrist seeks to make himself the leader in our spiritual conscience, precisely the place that Christ should have in our lives as our high priest. In the Bible, there is only one lawgiver, God, and anyone who seeks to become man's spiritual lawgiver places himself in God's stead and shows himself as if he is God. He doesn't do this in open rebellion against God, but in a false Christian disguise. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. We are God's temple, and the sanctuary shows Christ's work of salvation and his sanctification of us. This is the work that Christ does for us and in us, and that Antichrist seeks to destroy. To make this happen, the Antichrist must take the role as the high priest among God's children and then systematically destroy their salvation. Jesus did away with the earthly priesthood when he instigated the heavenly sanctuary and his own high priestly service. The Antichrist heaped contempt upon Christ's heavenly sanctuary and set up their own priesthood on earth instead. Today, the Antichrist is regarded as the highest Christian leader on earth. He holds the majority of Christian support in the world, and even leaders from other religions have bowed before his throne and dressed in black attire a sign of submission. He claims to have been given all power and to dictate what is and is not the truth. The Pope also regards it his privilege to correct mistakes that God has made in his law and present a new and better law. He calls himself Father and the Vicar of Christ or he who stands in the place of Christ. This is what the Pope and the Catholic Church has done to God's sanctuary, while they claim to stand in the place of Christ. They have destroyed every symbol in Christ's sanctuary. And now, we will show you how the Antichrist has destroyed God's sanctuary. Follow me. The Catholic Church gives the option to pray to Mary, the saints, and even priests, for them to mediate between you and God. But these are false mediators that do not even possess the authority that they claim to have. Thus they hinder many people from having a direct relationship with the true high priest. The Bible tells us that forgiveness is only through Christ's blood and his sacrifice. This symbolizes the burnt offering. The Catholic people try to obtain forgiveness through pilgrimages, rosary beads and indulgences. 
But Christ said that those who are not born with the Spirit and water will not see the kingdom of God. The symbol of baptism is a good conscience toward God and the putting away of your old life. A new birth and a new life after the sin is taken away. The Catholic Church has destroyed these symbols as well as their very meanings. When they substituted adult baptism with infant baptism and confirmation, the symbolism was destroyed, resulting in the unbelief of many Christians. The meaning of their so-called conversion, being the beginning of a new life, was totally lost. Jesus says that God's kingdom begins inside us. In the sanctuary, we find the symbols that show us how God sets his kingdom inside us while we are here on earth. The showbread represents God's word, as Jesus the high priest makes sure he enlightens us with the scripture. The Catholic Church has heaped doubt upon the accuracy of the word and laid aside portions of it regarding it as unnecessary. They've also added extra books to the Bible. During the Dark Ages, the people were not permitted to even read the Bible. Many people were burned at the stake for just copying and distributing it. The candlestick represents God's congregation and the Holy Spirit. The conditions for receiving the Holy Spirit are obedience to the commandments of God. But by changing the commandments, they have denied people the opportunity to receive of this blessing that Jesus, as our High Priest, has the power to give us. The altar of incense represents prayer, but the Bible says that whosoever turneth away his ear from hearing his law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. By turning millions of people away from the true law, they have sabotaged many of the prayers to God. And thus, it opens the way for God's arch enemy to answer them instead. Yet they still believe that they have God's favour. The Ark of the Covenant represents God's covenant, the atoning blood and the law. But the Catholic Church has removed the second commandment and changed the fourth. They changed the Saturday Sabbath, the day that God sanctified, to the Sunday. That way, they trick people into thinking that they have not sinned, when in fact, they have broken his commandment. Thus, they have hindered people from receiving the atoning blood and are still under God's judgment. The majority of Christian denominations have cast away God's plan of salvation in favour of a corrupt and distorted gospel. Jesus died so that we do not have to die an eternal death. He died so that we could eat the fruit of the tree of life and have eternal life. And he died because he refused to give us up, even though his own law condemned us to die. But because he could not remove the law without permitting sin in the universe, because the demands of the law should last forever, Christ had to take our place. This is the most amazing plan that has ever been put into action in the history of the world. No one in the universe would have to lose any respect for God or his law and order. Sin would be eradicated and the substitute would die in place of the sinner. Thus, neither the law nor mankind would have to be destroyed. Let Christ be your only high priest because he is faithful. Cling to his priestly ministry because no other priest and no other sanctuary leads to salvation. If Jesus is your high priest and your only saviour, you're safe, and God will take care of you. That same God who sent his Son because he loves you. John chapter 5 verses 7, 8, and 9 with you on the bus. Remember that? There are three that keep record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. There are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater, and this is God's witness and testimony of His Son. 
First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Folks, that's the place. And what the Bible tells us is that this is God the Father's proof to a lost world that they have been redeemed by the blood of his son right that is the father's proof when people have seen this and become aware of this if they reject that there's nothing else to follow that is the heart and soul of the plan of salvation and he has told us, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In other words, it don't matter what we've done in the past. It doesn't matter how weak and sinful our natures are. Christ made provision for all of that. And he died for us. All we have to do is go to the Father in the name and blood of the Son and ask for forgiveness and rehabilitation so we become Christ-like and we will be ready at His coming. And folks, when the Holy Spirit sets up housekeeping in our hearts, we will develop a love for lost souls that will constrain us to do those things which are very inconvenient, time-consuming, expensive, and all of that. And that is working for lost souls. And when Christ comes, instead of fleeing and trying to hide from the face of Him that sits on the throne, we'll look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. And that's our choice today, folks.